Marvel's 2022 summer event is a classic menage a trois between the Avengers, X-Men, and Eternals, in which the Eternals will be hunting down mutants in the name of deviancy, and the Avengers are caught in the middle, torn between their love of living inside a celestial and their love of taking a side against the X-Men. While Marvel's event batting average is pretty middling of late, Judgment Day is a logical next step from several good runs, including Eternals and the Krakoa era of X-Men. In this episode, I'll answer, what should you read in advance, what is this event, and why is it happening, what's to come, and what does it mean for Marvel Comics? This is The Road to Axe, Avengers vs. X-Men vs. Eternals, Judgment Day, the 2022 Marvel event. This is Crack and Krakoa, it's Ease and Eternals, it's Avoid and Avengers, it's all the above. It's comic book Herald's Road to Judgment Day. I'm Judgment Dave, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com. If you like CBH YouTube channel or Crack and Krakoa, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, and commenting. You can find full reading orders and guides linked in the show notes below. Some mild spoilers for previous series may follow. The short version of Judgment Days that Druig has interpreted the mutants of the Marvel Universe, now living on their sovereign island nation of Krakoa since 2019's House of X powers a 10 as a kind of deviant, and the Eternals' mission through the ages has been to curb, aka kill, excess deviancy. So yeah, the Eternals are prepared to go to war to kill the mutants, or, you know, at least some of them. It's increasingly common with Marvel events that the writer leading the event will use the other Marvel books they write to build to the event, and then likely to carry through supplemental plotlines. So in this case, Karen Gillan is the writer of Judgment Day, and the two most relevant books to read prior are his Marvel titles, Eternals, which has 15 issues released since 2021, and Immortal X-Men, which started earlier in 2022 and will have four issues out prior to Judgment Day. So really, the simplest possible answer for what to read before Judgment Day is to read House of X and Powers of Ten. Oh my gosh, how have you not read this yet? Read Eternals by Karen Gillan and Isad Rivich, and the weird one-shot tie-ins. Don't worry, I'll share those linked in the reading order for the Eternals. And then read Immortal X-Men by Karen Gillan and Lucas Wernick. That's about 30 comics total, which in terms of prep work is a fun evening. You can find the full list and links in the show notes, again, for the Judgment Day reading order on Comic Book Herald. Of course, this being the Marvel Universe, there's a lot that goes into the build to any event, and that's what I'll talk about now. Okay, so the Eternals are the ones starting a war in this event. What has been up with them? Eternals launches very much in the tradition and shadow of the Jonathan Hickman written House and Powers, as well as Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk, with Kieran Gillen seamlessly tying the Eternals to the Marvel Universe's increasing trend towards the death of death. This of course works quite well with the franchise known as the Eternals, where immortality is a fundamental part of the equation. Now I'm going to share the biggest developments from this Eternals run, so if you don't want to be spoiled, go check out the series, then come back here when you want to hear what I think of it, and seriously, go read it, it's really really good. Development number one, The Cost of Eternity. The first volume of, of Eternals ends with the terrible truth of being an Eternal and explains that though they can never die, they can also never win. The secret of Eternal Resurrection is that every time an Eternal is resurrected via the machine, aka the Earth, a random human dies. Now, part of the Gillen Rivich run is about establishing that there are 100 Eternals and their various factions in some sublime world building, by the way, and there are plenty of Eternals that aren't especially bothered by this given they see human life as fleeting anyway, right? What does it matter for them? But for most of our core Eternals, aka the ones we see in the MCU and featured in the original Jack Kirby comics like Icarus, Fastos, Thena, maybe kind of Cersei, this leads to great shame and guilt and the feeling that something must be done. And this is what drives the group to turn to the Deviants in the second act of this Eternals run to understand how to break these cycles that they've been a part of. Development number two, Eternal Heresy. From their creation by Jack Kirby in 1976 until 2018, and then the Gillen Ribbit run, the Eternals have understood they are the favored agents of the Cosmic Celestials, doing the bidding of the enigmatic gods before their various judgments of planet Earth. But we've seen over the past four years calls like, what we've seen has called all this into question. So you have the more religious, like Ajak and Macri, questioning, are they even agents of the Celestial? What is their point? Are all their histories and beliefs a lie? Worse, the Celestials have stopped speaking to the Eternals, but made time to chat with the Avengers and explain to them that Celestial pus and vomit is what makes them special. No, really, this is the first arc of Jason Aaron's Avengers. Insult to injury, the Avengers now live inside a dead Celestial. Specifically in Gillen's run, we learn the Celestials never really had a glorious purpose for the Eternals. Their real purpose was to keep things rolling long enough for the superheroes to go strong enough to purge the Celestial Plague from Earth. As Gillen puts it, the Eternals were nothing more than the lid on a petri dish. The Deviants, in fact, are the important ones. The Eternals exist so the Deviants do not undergo too many excess changes and destroy themselves. The Deviants are the mothers of the Age of Marvels. These are the dangerous truths of the Eternals. Development number three, on top of all that, the Thanos family. 
The masterstroke of this Eternals run is Gillen and crew finally merging Jim Starlin's cosmic lore with Mark Grunewald's Eternals lore and connecting Thanos the Eternal, Thanos the Deviant, to the franchise. Now, last we'd seen of Thanos was him being left for dead with Hela in the Donny Cates written Guardians of the Galaxy, but here Fastos pulled Thanos from a black hole and resurrected him, still not really fully himself, but with fail safes in place. Druk removed those fail safes in Thanos in order to utilize Thanos and ingratiate himself, and of course he copied the fail safes for himself for a later point. Thanos kills him for it in the moment, but Druid comes back. After all, they're eternal. Druid concocts an election manipulation scheme to get Thanos elected as Eternal Prime over Zerus, a throne he sits in for the second arc of the Gillen Eternals. That's right, Thanos is king of the Eternals for the second arc of this run. Seriously, it's good. Druig does ultimately outscheme Thanos, having him destroyed via all the failsafes as the machine nearly unleashes Uranus. We'll get to him in a second, armory, and destroys the Earth, setting up Druig as the hero of the Eternals. And as far as we know at this moment, Thanos is off the board. But this being Thanos, that obviously won't last. We are also introduced, crucially, to Uranus, Thanos' grandfather, okay, and grandfather here is mildly in quotes. He grants Thanos, he's imprisoned, by the way, in the exclusion, and he grants Thanos access to his armory, which can destroy all of Earth, which Thanos tries to do, right? If you're wondering, what are Uranus and Thanos after? Destroying all of Earth, always kind of a decent consolation prize for both of them. Thanos also claims that if he ever dies, Earth dies, which is why he's been imprisoned for millennia, it seems. Again, the big question is, what do these characters want? Well, again, destruction of the Earth is definitely on the table. Uranus, in particular, was excluded for his heretical views about committing genocide on all deviants, right? Part of the Eternal Code is to correct excess deviancy. Uranus was like, how about we just kill them all? And people were like, uh, maybe that's too much. <laughs> maybe that's too much. Something that could work to Druk's favor, knowing Uranus the schemer, is of course that, well, he wants to destroy deviancy, so we can see Druig turn to Uranus at the end of the Eve of Judgment prelude issue and say, hey, I've got some deviancy that needs correcting. All of which takes us to the 2022 Free Comic Book Day and Eve of Judgment preludes to Judgment Day where Druig schemes against a new common deviant enemy, the mutants. This raises the question as to whether or not mutants should in fact be considered deviants. Personally, I prefer keeping mutants separate from Marvel's race of deviants, but ultimately, for the purposes of Druig's scheme, it's kind of irrelevant. Druig doesn't actually care if mutants count as excess deviation. He just wants to give the Eternals a mission to keep them feeling productive and responsive to his leadership, right? The plot to destroy the mutants for Druig is a matter of keeping him as Prime Eternal and maintaining his power. He does not care. <laughs> if mutants count as deviants, I promise you that. Which brings us, of course, to those mutants and the X-Men. Now, the Krakoa X-Men are in the Destiny of X, the third phase of their post-House and Powers era of comics, one in which we've seen moderate changes to the Quiet Council, their ruling body, mutant kind claiming Mars as Planet Arako, the capital of the Soul System, and the world very recently found out that mutants are immortal now. Oh, and Moira X, the mutant with the gift of reincarnation and the strategic mastermind behind Krakoa, is now a cyborg and sworn enemy of mutants. It's the sort of thing that just might come up in an event. The mutants of Krakoa have plenty of threats, both internal and external, primarily in the form of Orcus, the human-machine alliance to prevent mutant ascension. But up until this point, the Eternals haven't played a role in their story and will likely come as a surprise to everyone except for the increasingly essential precognitive mutant destiny. Again, in terms of the most important recent developments, the secret of mutant immortality being exposed will lead to a lot of global anger at the mutants keeping the secret to themselves, and also to increased threats for mutant kind as their enemies now have a new way to strike at their mutant haven. This matters both in terms of the X-Men's relationship with the Avengers and the political and interpersonal pressures that come with aiding the X-Men during this moment, but also in terms of the E. Eternal schemes, right? What are they going to do about mutant resurrection? In preview pages shared with EW.com, we see panels of the Eternals striking at the heart of Krakoan resurrection and the Five as Druig appears to scheme with freshly minted ex-arch enemy Moira X. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if these were a tease and actually depicting more of a how would we do it, but nonetheless, I expect that's the Eternals' plan. Take away their immortality first and foremost. If they can't come back, right, they're as destroyable as anyone. The involvement of Moira X will be particularly compelling given we haven't seen much specific from the former Krakoan strategist since her rapid descent in this year's earlier X Lives and X Deaths of Wolverine. Or at least we hadn't until the ending of this year's X-Men Hellfire Gala, also confirming Moira is in fact working with Druig for the Eternals to take out Krakoa, strategically targeting them and aiming them at the Five and the means of resurrection. The other biggest elements of X-Men to expect coming into play stem from Gillen's immortal X-Men run he's writing and the Al Ewing written X-Men Red, the two best series in Marvel's X-Men comics right now. 
In Immortal X-Men, Gillen is setting up a hundred-year-old game of chess between Destiny and Mr. Sinister, with Sinister in particular currently cloning Moira in order to relive experiences on Krakoa to shape the country to his own design. Given this setup and Gillen's affinity for Sinister, check out 2011's X-Men Everything is Sinister for his first revamp of the villain, look for Sinister's Moira clones to play a potentially very significant role as this series continues. X-Men Red is significant because it highlights the cosmic presence of mutant kind and the fact that an earthbound Krakoa at war still leaves millions of war-ready mutants on planet Araco. They're just a Krakoan portal away from rushing into Slaughter Eternals, so don't forget about the Araco mutant population. If you consider this a war of numbers, mutant kind is way, way, way more heavily staffed than the Eternals. Now, realistically, the Krako era for mutants is far from over, so it's hard to imagine the Eternals upending too much. But there are recent trends in X-Men Red with characters like Magneto and Storm walking back their resurrection opportunities, so it's possible we could see mutant immortality truly threatened, although that would be a bit too much of a repeat as Ten of Swords, for my liking, if you really get down to it. On the Avengers side of things, I honestly have very little idea what's going on because I checked out of the Jason Aaron and Ed McGuinness run shortly after the War of Vampires, see also like three years ago. But for you, the dear listener, I went back into those dark minds and extracted some highlights. The biggest thing you should know about the Avengers right now is their lineup has expanded a bit since 2018's fresh start and now includes the like of Echo, Maya Lopez as the Phoenix, Oh, and also the Phoenix is Thor's mom, but that's a topic for another time. Nighthawk, Namor, who's on probation, and Jane Foster as Valkyrie. Also, I think the Celestial they live inside might be inhabited by a Deathlock now. Just FYI. Truly, apart from that, I don't think you'll need to read a single semi-recent issue from this run of Avengers. They're mostly dealing with multiverse stuff and Mephisto, and it probably won't come into play here, and Jason Aaron continues to write the book like I hit the dollar menu at Wendy's. Fast, reckless, and full preposterous combinations. There will be Celestials, but how and when? That's a big question here, right? It's called Judgment Day. The Celestials' whole deal (laughs) from the Kirby Eternals is they come back and they judge humanity and deviance and Eternals and determine if they're worth it. In Eve of Judgment, the prelude issue, we see Ajak and Macquarie working on what Fastos calls building a god. So perhaps they're designing their own Celestial to break free from the broken rules of the previous godhood. Oh, by the way, they've also captured Mr. Sinister, or should we say a Mr. Sinister, given how often he clones himself, it's hard to know which one, to help them make the Celestial, okay? And if we will remember, Okay, from the Gillen X-Men run, which started in 2011, the first thing Sinister does, and everything is Sinister, he hijacks the Dreaming Celestial's head and turns it into his own little spinning Celestial head base. He's got Celestial ties, okay? Him, capturing him is not an accident. That's not an oversight. That's all going to be super Celestial-based. They will play a role in this run. The question is just, of course, to what exact end? I have high hopes. For Judgment Day. Truly, I think it's going to be pretty good. Karen Gillan is a writer I trust a lot. Their work throughout the Marvel Universe at this point in time is some of the best in the Marvel un- Universe. Uh, Eternals, one of my favorite series. Immortal X-Men, on its way to becoming one of my favorite series. One of the best X-Books right out of the gate in the Destiny of X. Again, when an event launches from the pen of a writer who's already doing good stuff in the Marvel Universe, that event tends to at least be competently told and interesting. I think Gillan's got an interesting perspective on things, and I am here for Judgment Day. But that should give you all you need to know about the event right now. Definitely um, check it out. Definitely check out the reading order in the show notes. It will be updated every week over on comicbookherald.com as new comics are released to place things chronologically, because this is one I will definitely be following along with. Thank you to everybody who supports Comic Book Herald over on patreon.com slash comic book herald. If you support us at the mysterious benefactors tier, you can, of course, get your name shouted out here on the video, thank you, Jesse W., Professor Pride, Cole Weathers, Martin Lopez, Chris Isidro, Brent Bowser, Professor X3769, Petey Appleseed, Verisimilitude, Terra Nort, Ed Mackey, Clyde Glide, Pinball Drew, Mike Solomons, and Matt Mahoney for past support on patreon.com slash comic book herald. I'm Dave. You can find all my stuff, of course, at the website, at comic book herald on social, Twitter and Instagram primarily. Look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more from me. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics. <laughs>